Scripture has a lot of words for us uh, that are supposed to comfort our hearts. I think one of the ones we most often think of when we think of comforting words is probably the 23rd Psalm. But the Scripture tells us also in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, there are some other comforting words. It says, um, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another yes. with these words. Those are some comfort. 23rd Psalm is very comforting. It's very comforting to know that when that trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ rise and we join them in the air, we're going to ever be with the Lord and all this madness and chaos that's going on on the earth will be a thing of the past. Amen. Isn't that a comforting thought? As we look around us in these days we're living in, 
Amen. 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 And we've got a really beautiful home here, amen? Right. And God's given us a good place. But he says next one's going to be better. Amen. amen. And so I look forward to the day that uh, we get to be with Jesus. As a matter of fact, I, I texted my cousin David. Just something this week had reminded me of my cousin Stephanie. I was really close to her, and, and uh, she passed away. She was killed in an accident. But I texted David, and I said, this, this little thing that happened with our kids reminded me of me and Stephanie, and I said, I just, I can't wait to see her again, and there will be a reunion, amen, yeah. it's kind of like people coming back to church after they've been laying out, we got to get to see everybody, you can't even help it, no matter how much you say, don't shake hands, don't hug necks, it, everybody's kind of doing that anyway, amen, <laughs> and, uh, but the reason why is because we're family, and I just look forward to the day we get to heaven, and that reunion will be really sweet, amen. We'll get to be with everybody, and that will be a blessing. It should, it should challenge us to share the gospel with those who aren't ready, amen, uh, because they need to be saved. They need to know the gospel. If you've got your Bible, go to Exodus uh, chapter 2. That's where we're going to start tonight. And as you know, we've been uh, preaching on central figures, key heroes, men and women of the Bible, the Old Testament. Uh, many of these are stories, Bible stories that you would have, uh, if you grew up in a Christian home, you would have heard of Moses and Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, these men that we've covered. But the truth is, as, as I've been working with our young people, I began to realize a year ago or so that a lot of our kids don't, don't know those Bible stories. Now that's a challenge for you as parents that your, 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 your kids need to know the Word of God. And uh, to me, it would be a crying shame if your kid knew all the names of the Paw Patrol team and didn't know the patriarchs. Amen? Right. Right. Amen. I mean, you know, your kids ought to know Bible stories because they're true and, and they're inspired by God. This is not just stories. This is the Word of God that we read. And so tonight we will look again at Moses after having preached a message about those figures really behind the story of Moses the midwives that spared the lives of those baby boys, and then Amram and Jochebed, his parents, who by faith they hid Moses. And, and parents, I just want to challenge you. There's some stuff that we ought to hide our kids from. That's right. Amen. And that there's shelter is not a negative word. Right. It's actually a necessity. Yeah. And we have to, um, you know, we, food, shelter, water, those are necessities. And there are some far more detrimental things to our children spiritually than just the elements. I mean, we just saw this week in Oklahoma, a two-year-old can live just fine overnight out by himself. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Little fella just camped out by himself and got a horse ride home. I don't know if y'all saw that, but people prayed for the baby that was lost. And it turned out he didn't look any worse for the wearer, really. Um, and, uh, I mean... Our kids were out of the house two nights last week, sleeping in tents in the backyard. I was out there with them sometimes. <laughs> and Connor started how I got scared and went in the house. <laughs> but, uh, but I do think it's, it's important as parents to realize that there's some stuff we ought to protect our kids from. Moses' journey started out with faithful parents. I think that's important. But tonight we're going to pick up and we're going to look at uh, something similar to what we did last week. Last week we used Hebrews 11. We actually used New Testament commentary on Moses to highlight certain aspects of Moses' life that didn't just pop out. When the Bible talks about the fact that he chose to suffer with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He knew he had an identity with the people of God. And we see that summarized in the New Testament. And I've mentioned this. The best commentary on the Word of God is in the Word of God. And so we're going to look at Exodus 2. If you would stand with me and we'll read verses 11 and 12. And then I'm going to have you flip with me to the New Testament. And we are going to read an excerpt from Stephen's sermon in Acts 7. So Exodus chapter 2, verse 11, it says, And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown 
Then he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens, and he spied an Egyptian smiting an Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that way, and when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Let me go ahead. And he, when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together, and he said unto him that did the wrong, Wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? And he said, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killest the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. Now, if you will, turn with me to Acts. Acts chapter 7. And I know that takes some flipping there in your Bible, but uh, we're going to now be looking at one of the deacons that was appointed by the church in Jerusalem. And he was full of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says. And as he spoke, he didn't just serve, but he preached the gospel. And persecution rose up. And most of you know Stephen wound up being stoned. But this is the message that he preached that got him in so much hot water. We're going to read just an excerpt of it, starting there in verse 20. Now, as Stephen preached, and he went through Old Testament truths that these Jewish people would have heard and known about, he now says in verse 20, in which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. And when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And he's recounting the same story we just read. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. But look at what verse 25 says. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them. But they understood not. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, ye are brethren, why do you wrong one to another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then fled Moses at this saying and was a stranger in the land of Midian, where he begat two sons. And when forty years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. And when Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight. And as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled and durst not behold. Then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. I have seen. I have seen the affliction of my people which is in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send thee into Egypt. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. Tonight, I want to preach about the big difference between the Moses that left Egypt and then the Moses that went back. I'm going to preach about the difference in the man that was willing to deliver the people and the man God sent to deliver his people. And it was a big difference, as we will see. Lord, we love you and praise you. God, I thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray as we look at your dealings, Lord, with your man Moses, God, that tonight I pray that we would apply our hearts, Lord, that we would have ears to hear. And God, as your church today, as your People this evening, God, I pray that me, my brothers and sisters in Christ that are here, that we would be edified and encouraged, God, that we would be uh, challenged and convicted if necessary, God, and that we would be better equipped for the work of the ministry. Lord, I pray that if someone here tonight has not trusted you, if they're not redeemed, if they've never been born again, that your Holy Spirit would do a work in their heart and that they would be saved is our prayer. And God, above all, we want you to be exalted, lifted up, and glorified. We love you, and we praise you, and we give you this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. <laughs> Hebrews 11 gives us this type of commentary. It says that Moses refused and then choosing to suffer. And I, I talked about the fact that it's clear that there was a pretty big decision made in young Moses' mind at some point 
there when he left Egypt. Tonight, we're going to look at this, uh, really this message that Stephen preached. He points out something that the Old Testament doesn't really tell us, and I don't know exactly how Stephen knew this, but I do believe that Stephen's a pretty good source when the Bible says that shortly after this message, Jesus Christ stood at the Father's right hand in approval of Stephen. Uh -huh. I believe Stephen was a man of God with insight, yet he gives us some information here that really creates some conflict when you read back in Exodus. And if you still have your finger in Exodus chapter 2, go back there because uh, I want to skip to chapter 3 and read what follows. And this is the calling of Moses. Moses, in case you're not familiar with the, uh, the chronology of his life, Moses' life could very easily be broken into three sections. Forty year periods of time. For 40 years, he was a prince of Egypt. He lived in Egypt. Although he knew he was an Israelite, he did not run. He did not have a warrant put out for him. And he did not have to leave Egypt in fear of his life until he was 40 years old. At age 40, he leaves and comes to Midian. He sees, I, I think, probably seven little girls with a handful of sheep trucking down there to the well and defends them and gets brought home to Jethro, Ruel, the priest of Midian, and he's content to live there. And after a while, he marries one of those girls, a poor, and he has a son, and, and he works for Jethro. He's a shepherd. He's just a laborer in the field taking care of sheep, and he did that for 40 years. So it's 40 years. This is important. Moses is 80 years old when the burning bush takes place. Now, some of you may not have known that. It's hard to, to know that because Charlton Heston ages so well. <laughs> I mean, you know the beard is there, but you just have a hard time really distinguishing how old he is, amen? But, but there, here in the story, as you read God's Word, you begin to see that something has happened in Moses' life between age 40 and age 80. And this is laid out very clearly as you see Exodus chapter 3. And please bear with me, but let's read, read this, not all of it, but a portion of this. It says, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and beheld the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not thy hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. By the way, you'll notice that Stephen is very accurate in his, I believe, almost off-the-cuff retelling of this story. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is coming to me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee, that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I am come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. Yes. And he said, Thou shalt say 
unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And you see this dialogue begin. And I, I simply read that chunk to point out that at this point, God does most of the talking in chapter 3, only interrupted occasionally by the objections of Moses. Uh -huh. Moses made objections. He said in verse 13, they won't think that I know you. They won't believe I know you. They'll ask me your name. Verse 11, he said, who am I that I could even do this? In chapter 4, verse 1, as the conversation continues, Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. Listen, Mo God is unloading divine revelation to, and his calling to Moses, explaining why he's going to deliver him, where he's going to take him to. God is giving him details. Listen, he's doing something for Moses that I believe at age 40, Moses would have been happy to have heard, happy to have received. He's giving him a calling to deliver his people. And yet Moses objects and objects and objects again. He says in 4 verse 1, they won't believe me, they won't listen to me. Verse 10 of chapter 4, he says, I'm not eloquent, I'm slow of tongue. Verse 13, he said, send someone else. At that point, God's not so mad at Egypt anymore. He's getting mad at the deliverer of Israel. He's getting mad at Moses. I just think this is an amazing story because Stephen says in Acts 7 that when Moses slew the Egyptian, he supposed that his brethren would know that he was going to deliver them. What changed? What changed? Because this almost seems like a contradictory story. I mean, wait a minute. You mean Moses knew that God would deliver his people by his hand? He did. He supposed that. That's what it says in Acts 7. Listen, by the way, I believe Moses was not illiterate in the things of God. I really don't. I believe that he knew that God had told Abraham, your children are going to be strangers for 400 years. And guess what? Time was up. Time was up. I think Moses looked around and he had enough sense to know prophecy had been fulfilled. And he knew God's people was getting ready to go out. And he said, hey, who better to lead them out than me? Listen, Moses, the coincidence, the, these coincidental things that had put him in this place of power were not lost on him. And I say coincidence in parentheses, in quotations here. It was no coincidence that Pharaoh's daughter found Moses. But the Bible says, Stephen speaking, that Moses, 40-year-old Moses, was mighty in words and in deeds. Doesn't even seem like the same guy that God's talking to, does it? Look at the difference, this first point tonight, the difference in Moses at age 40 and age 80. The title of the message, the big difference, not just the difference in Moses, as we're going to focus on right now, but we will soon see that there is a major difference in our way of thinking and God's way of thinking. Uh -huh. Good. At age 40, Moses was willing to kill, to avenge, and to deliver, and to judge Israel. At age 80, he is apparently unwilling to a fault to do the very thing he wanted to do at age 40. At, at, at age 80, he was unwilling. At age 40, he supposed that they would have understood. At age 40, he assumed, he is supposed, they'll understand. Listen, when God calls him at age 80 to deliver them, he assumes they will not understand. Moses' optimism towards the character of the people of God had changed. Stephen says at age 40, he supposes they're going to understand and say, Yet Moses! At age 80, he goes, Nah, they ain't going to, they ain't going to receive me. They'll, they'll shoot this idea down, God. Listen, at age 40, he was self-confident. The Bible says, Stephen speaking, that he was mighty. At age 80, in Exodus 3 and 4, he is self-abasing. He's no longer mighty, he's weak. At 
age 40, he voluntarily visited his children, his brethren, his brethren, the children of Israel who were afflicted. At age 80, he contradicted God's call and said, can't you just send someone else to go down there to him? It's interesting. At age 40, he was mighty in words. At age 80, he was slow of tongue. Same guy. Big difference. I've had some people say, well, Moses was throwing out lies towards God, or maybe Stephen didn't know Moses as good as he thought he did. No, I believe both statements are true. You know, and I, I understand Moses was going to live to be 120. There's probably not anybody in this room. Our life expectancy in America, especially if you start laying on top of uh, our natural, you know, fallen humanity our, and our fast food lifestyle and coronavirus and murder hornets, we're not going to make one point, okay? <laughs> but the fact remains, Moses, at age 80, considered his life, I, I really believe, considered the bulk of the usefulness of his life, I think he thought it was probably over. I mean, all he had in front of him was the last third, because he was going to make one twenty. I don't believe he probably knew that. And so 80 for Moses may have been stronger than 80 is for our church members, although I don't think I'd want to fight Billy Jones. <laughs> You're close to 80, aren't you, Brother Billy? Close to 80. You close to it? <laughs> like, it's in the rearview mirror, but you're still close, right? <laughs> and I don't know. I know Christians, you know, strong buck, but if they were to fight, I might put my money on Billy. Yeah. <laughs> but, but the fact is, Moses at age 80, no matter how strong he was as an 80-year-old shepherd, and I'm sure he was in better shape than the average American at age 80, he was not strong anymore like he was when he was 40. Amen? I mean, right. things changed. Moses was not superhuman. He was a shepherd, and things had changed. Listen, there was a time when he was up to date on the news, no doubt Egypt being an international hub, there was probably a time when Moses was 30, 34, 35 years old where he could have stood in any room with anybody. There was no group of royalty that he would have felt uncomfortable in. Listen, growing up in Pharaoh's home, he regularly sat on the lap probably of a man he considered his grandpa who had the power of life and death in his hands. And listen, there were nations leveled by the Egyptian armies and during the time that Moses would have considered Egypt home. Egypt was a world power. And he was one of the princes there. He was mighty in word and mighty in deeds for a while. But then he goes to Midian in fear for his life. I don't know how long he laid low out of fear, but for a while I'm sure he looked over his shoulder wondering, <coughs> somebody going to show up to drag me back to Egypt in chains? And although that never happened, it seems interesting that Moses wasn't just camping out close. He, he was with the furthest ranging flock of sheep, taking care of his father-in-law's sheep. He was not only in exile, he was already living in a place of obscurity, relatively speaking, to the palace. I, I highlight the difference between Moses at 40 and Moses at 80. Listen, after being a shepherd for 40 years, he felt more comfortable laying on the ground looking at the stars than he felt standing in a room in the palace in the place of kings. He no longer felt eloquent. I think probably some of that came from being married to a younger gal, no doubt, who probably had been. I mean, his wife had seven sisters. Truth is, after 40 years in that home, he probably couldn't get a word in edgewise. You know? <laughs> you get rusty. I'm just staring at me in the mirror. It's fine. It's interesting. <laughs> That's not that. That's just my commentary. I don't know if that had anything to do with it at all. But the fact is, at eighty, he's not very confident in his abilities anymore. And this, this is why I point that out because it's not just a difference in Moses, forty years removed from who he had been. The Bible makes it clear that 
We serve a God whose ways are higher than our ways. Isaiah 55 verse 8, God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Interesting note, as I was reading this week, studying this, God says, my ways are not your ways, but do you know there is one little nugget in Psalms 103, verse 7? The Bible says that God did make his ways known to Moses. Uh -huh. What did God make known to Moses? God made known this, that God abases the proud, a truth that Nebuchadnezzar had to learn. In Daniel 4, 37, Nebuchadnezzar, after coming off of a time of exile, I mean, he was turned out like a cow. You can read the story there in Daniel chapter 4. But when Nebuchadnezzar looked up and he once again came to his senses, he said, I know this, that God can do whatever he wants and he can abase the proud. Listen, even in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, if you would turn there, you may not have this committed to, to memory, but this is a powerful passage. And listen, if anything highlights the gospel of God and the grace of God, this passage should be highlighted in our Bibles. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse, verse 24. I'll, I'll actually just drop back to verse 23. It says, But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling. Listen, we're we looking at Moses' calling. Paul now says, hey, why don't you pay attention to your calling? Good. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. <coughs> But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who, it, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Amen. Why would God prefer 80-year-old Moses to 40-year-old Moses? If you were going to deliver your people from Egypt, if you were going to have a man stand before Pharaoh... Wouldn't you want the fellow that was mighty in words and deeds? Or would you want the guy that was slow of tongue? I mean, these were the choices. And it just shows you this. Listen, that God calls who he will. God does not call. Listen, the calling of God, when God chooses us, guys, listen, this is beautiful. The church of God is not an NFL team. Did y'all know that? I mean, God does not, we're not, it's not like we're in the draft and God says, wow, got to have that guy. Look how fast he is. Look how big he is. Look how strong he is. Man, I could do something if I only had a guy that smart, that bright. That's not the way God works with things. See, Paul said in 1 Corinthians, God does not go after the cream of the crop. He scrapes the bottom of the barrel. Mm -hmm. I'm paraphrasing. Amen. 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 Hey, praise God for that. Because this gives us proper perspective. This gives us the true gospel. That's where we are, friends. We're at the bottom of the barrel. By the way, the most mighty, brightest, smartest, wisest human compared to God's wisdom is on the bottom of the barrel. But it should be noted, Paul says, not many mighty. Not many wise, not, listen, not many strong. God doesn't do it that way. And I just believe, listen, when you look at God's ways versus man's ways, that the difference between Moses at 40 and Moses at 80 is the distance between mighty and meek. See, the gap between age 40 and age 80 there's a distance there. And this is something we're going to look at. What is the distance from mighty in word and deeds?
to me. See, Numbers 12, verse 3 says, Now the man Moses was very mean yeah. above all other men. I don't know if that would have been true of him at age 40. He wasn't born meek. Meekness is a character quality that God instills in fallen mankind. It's a grace of God, like the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, and peace. I believe that meekness was something that was developed in the life of Moses. And here is the distance. It is the distance between a role assumed and responsibility assigned. See, he wanted to assume the mantle of deliverer, and he wasn't God's man at that time. He was God's man. And by the way, I think it's interesting that he knew he was the man for the job at age 40. He wasn't wrong as far as the identity. He was just wrong on the time. Good. Something Dad said this morning. Do you know that when it comes to relationships, the right guy at the wrong time is the wrong guy? Girls, did y'all know that? The right guy at the wrong time is the wrong guy. And in God's economy, God's timing is different than ours. What is the distance between mighty and meek? For, for, for Moses, it was 40 years. Think about this. His 40-year shepherding life is just given to us in a few verses. We don't know a lot of the details there. But here's what we do know. He was living and working for his in-laws. I love my mom and dad-in-law, but... I don't think I want to live with them. Amen? Amen? I mean, they don't, they don't want that. Right? I mean, talk about cutting down your lifespan. We'd both die real quick if we had to put up with each other all the time. Amen? I'm not easy to live with. You can ask Lauren. Moses lived with his in-laws, worked for his father-in-law. And I, I, I think that'd be fine, really. I, I actually can think of a whole lot of people I'd rather work for than my father-in-law. But it's interesting that Moses was put on the desert for 40 years. He was, chapter 4, verse 18, you know, after God commissioned him, he got permission from Jethro to go to, to Egypt. He was living in his home. He, he was under his, I think if, if they were somewhat nomadic shepherds, it was Jethro, not Moses, that was the patriarch. Moses was just the Egyptian Israelite cast off that had become the son-in-law. He got permission. He was submitted to Jethro. The distance from mighty to me. First of all, it's an issue of timing. Did you know that God's timetable is not yours? Listen, it's often it's been said that God is often slow, but he's never late. But God's timetable is so different than mine. Listen, if you were to tell me that the Son of God would come down and walk among us, I would expect that he would do insignificant things for about three years and then 30 years have a ministry. It was just the opposite, actually. I mean, age 12, you see him at the temple. He wanted to be about his father's business. What was his father's business for the next 18 years? It was being subject to his mom and dad and growing in, the Bible says he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and men. That's pretty much what, all we know from age 12 to 30. And his earthly ministry pretty much was over and done with in three years. 30 years of prep, even for the Son of God for a three-year ministry. Well. See, that's not the way we would do it, is it? I mean, Moses, with the, the 40 best years of his life, I believe, if you had his perspective, was wasted chasing sheep. See, God's timing, the distance between 40 and 80 for Moses, the distance between the role he would have assumed and then the responsibility he was given by God. Listen, the distance between him volunteering for a place he wasn't ready for and him being appointed, divinely appointed to his destiny was a difference of God's timetable. It was a difference of testing. And I say testing because guess what prepared Moses? Moses thought at age 40 that walking the halls of the palace prepared him to deliver the people. But you know what God knew? God knew that the real preparation for leading his people was tending to sheep. Yes. That's right. That's good. The real prep for what God's big ministry was wasn't walking the palace. 
wasn't getting educated in all the ways of the Egyptians, which the Bible says he was. No, God didn't need him to be good at that. God needed him to fish sheep out of thorn bushes. That's good. Right? That's what they had to do out there in those parts. Sheep are dumb. Sheep are dumb. And they don't smell that great. I mean, I know they look cute when you see those pictures of those little lambs. They are cute when they're lambs. But, hey, I've messed with some sheep. Vance had sheep that he worked his cow dogs on for years. And a, a year, about twice a year for a number of years, I'd have to go and help him shear them suckers. And he had these hand shears that looked like scissors. And it took forever. And their legs are very thin, kind of scrawny looking. Uh, but they're quite quick. And you'd be surprised how bad it smarts when they kick you. <laughs> and they do kick you. I mean, sheep are just... I mean, I'm sure they taste good if they're cooked right. That might be their only saving grace. If, if I was a chef, I would be, not be a good shepherd. Like the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, not this cowboy. <laughs> no, no, maybe my horse, but not that sheep. See, God took Moses through a time of testing. He had him tending to sheep. I think it's interesting that some of God's favorite leaders had to be shepherds. First, David, isn't it interesting that when a king was anointed out of the house of Jesse, it wasn't the two older, mighty, royal-looking warrior brothers, because he had some of those. No, it was the baby. It was the runt who was out there tending to the sheep that God chose. Why? Because God even said, hey, I wanted a shepherd's heart. And here Moses was, listen, he would shepherd God's people he would intercede for some people that kept wanting to go back to the wrong place, like sheep. God prepared Moses for the job of delivering his people by taking care of sheep. God prepared Abraham 100 years for the job of daddy. God's timetable is different than ours. The distance from mighty to meek was timing, it was testing, and ultimately in Moses' life it was temperament. What's the difference you see in Moses? Well, the Bible says he was meek. He was humble. First Peter chapter 5, the Bible says, speaking of God's character, his nature it says that God resists us. We're told to be clothed with humility, to be subject one to another. For God resisteth the proud. He giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Why does God tell us this? Matter of fact, this is repeated in God's word. God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. See, God knows when time is right. And God's timetable for promotion and exaltation, it comes, listen, after humility. Forty years of obscurity that Moses lived in, he was no longer attached to the idea of delivering the people. That dream had died. Somewhere along the lines, he had let it go and said, that's not going to be me. I thought it was me. It's not me. And God said, now I'm going to call you. I just think that's interesting. That Moses, it's very clear, had given up on the idea when God decided the time was right. Now, I'm not saying that we should argue with God when he calls us, but it is interesting that God would rather have a man who felt so incapable of doing the job that he, he objected than to have a self-confident young man that thought he could do it in his own strength. That's right. Because right. mm -hmm. we can't do it in our own strength. Listen, the thing that God has called you to do, you cannot do it in your own strength. We need him. And this is very... I have to do this it's very humbling to know that the thing that 
is a roadblock to God. It's not logistics. It's not, listen, do you know that God is not intimidated by your social status, by your economic status? God is not intimidated by where you grew up, who you are. Listen, when God was preparing Joseph, he took him to Potiphar's house as a slave, and then he took him to prison, falsely accused, to get him where he needed to be to prepare him for the palace. See, God's ways are different than our ways. We can't see what's coming around the bend. But God knows. God knows. And God wants us to be in a place where we're listening. Now, can I just make a point here? It's also important to note that Moses didn't do nothing. He was working. He, he was taking care of sheep. Do you know that the Bible says in Jeremiah, it's good for a young man to bear the youth? bear a yoke in the days of his youth. Young men, listen, if you think God has a calling for your life, great. You need to work hard. You may say, well, I, listen, I, I had men at, at just this year, this summer, I had two men, both of them tell me they've been called to preach in prison, and they were regular at our prison ministry services. And by the way, we need to pray for our men. Got a letter from Brother Mike Elder, one of the guys that's in prison, and it's it's hard, because they're not getting, we're not getting to have services. They're being restricted in ways because of the coronavirus. And so um, our, our men that we've led to the Lord are still meet and study the best they can. But a couple of these fellas just this past summer came and talked to me. And, and they said, hey, we're called. We're, we're called to preach and we're getting an opportunity. You know, once a month we get a chance to do kind of a devotion here at the chapel with some of the men. But they said, what do you think we should do so we could get our feet on the ground and start ministering? Like your minister, and I said, well, that's not hard at all. You, where are you going to when you get out? They both told me they had churches in the places they were going. I said, then just start serving in your church. And the, the guy said, I don't, I don't think they'll let me. I said, oh, yeah, they will. And he goes, I, I don't know. I, it's a pretty good size church. I don't think they'll let me. I said, do they have a yard to mow? And he goes, what? I said, do they have a yard to mow? The church that you're going at. Uh, yeah, they do. They got toilets. They have indoor plumbing at that church. Yeah, they do. Well, maybe they're paying someone to do it. Why don't you volunteer and do it for nothing? That's like giving the church money, time. And as a serious, he, he chuckled. He goes, now, you know, I'm called to preach, brother. I told him, I said, hey, you know, when I got called to preach, I told God I would never ask. Never volunteer to preach, but I wouldn't turn it down if I got asked. Amen? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to fish for an invite. I'm not going to tell somebody, come let me, I want to preach. I mean, I do want to preach. Don't get me wrong. But I said, nobody's going to keep you from serving. Do you know there's many people in the ministry? I think there's a lot of potential notices that are too lazy to hike with the sheep to the backside of the desert, yeah. so they never get to see the burning bush. Wow. What I'm saying is, Moses, for all of his flaws, he was being faithful at something. He was working for his father-in-law, taking care of sheep, doing what he was supposed to do. What I'm saying is, listen, don't ask for God's direction if you are not moving. That's good. Do what God, what you already know is good for you to do. Do, listen, whatever God has called you to do, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. That's right. Listen, he was going to hike with God's people for 40 years, starting at age 80. I don't think he'd have been in the shape to do it had he stayed at home and kept up with what was current on Netflix. <laughs> Amen? Right. Now, he's out hiking around with sheep. He was in perfectly fine shape to march with people because he'd been marching with sheep anyways. These are just practical things, but they kind of stick out to me. And I want to close with this. You see, Moses found the place, and he had to submit. At this point, at age 80, his job was simply to submit to the place of divine appointment. He no longer volunteered to go save the people. He had to be drafted. But this is important. He obeyed 
Although I think God had to go way out of his way to show him. But do you know what Moses was waiting for? He was waiting for divine revelation. Nothing short of that would get him to go. I mean, he literally, God had to say, hey, I'm going to show you some divine signs. I'm backing you up. Listen, I think how, how blessed we would be if we, instead of chasing our own desires, if we would be willing to seek God and His divine direction and us submit to a place of divine appointment. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Amen. See, there's an application here for us tonight. Did you know that it is possible that your difficulty, your disappointment, your current displacement could really be God's divine direction? Could be. It could be God's hand of preparation. The difficulty you're in. You might say, but Brother Clay, I'm in a place of obscurity. Don't worry. God knows where you're at. Right. God knows where you're at. I, I don't know. I think it's interesting. I, I read this word over and over again, and things begin to stick out, and I'm not sure if there's something there or not, but it is interesting that Moses was taking his father-in-law's sheep, is said to the mountain of God. <coughs> I mean, he didn't, he didn't have burning bush experiences every day. I seriously believe this was the only time that ever happened. Yet, yet the Bible said that that Mount, Mount Horeb was the mountain of God. And people say, well, sure it is, because as you read Exodus in retrospect, yes, it was the mountain of God. But I, I believe that another reason that Moses was the man for the job was because he had gotten more accustomed to seeking God than he did seeking man's approval. I believe out there in the, in the desert, I believe that Moses became that meek, submitted man that God needed him to be. God is more concerned about your character than he is your capacity, your capabilities. You know, if you've got good character, you're humble, God can use you. It, listen, I look at the 12 disciples and I look at the amount of people we've got in our church. We could turn the world upside down. Mm -hmm. We could turn the world upside down if we were submitted to divine direction. But what gets in the way? Why aren't we in the place of divine appointment? Some of us are just too proud. We appoint our own place. We decide where we want to be. We do not submit to God's divine inspired direction. It could be that you're here tonight and you're saved. But you've always just submitted your plan to God for approval. You know that's really not prayer. Right. That's right. Are, are you seeking God or are you simply asking God to rubber stamp whatever it is that you want to do? Because there is a difference. Amen. So, have you trusted in Him with all your heart? Are you leaning on your own understanding? Are you willing to acknowledge Him? What does it mean to acknowledge God in all our ways? Well, you know, acknowledging Him can sometimes mean if, if there's three people having a conversation and no, one person never gets heard from, in a sense, you haven't acknowledged them. How do you acknowledge God? You check what he says about the way you're going. Do you acknowledge him in all your ways? Trust in the Lord and he'll direct your path. I believe that the only way Moses could lead was because he was able to follow good. God's direction. Yes. And that was the difference between age 40 and age 80. And here's a great bit of encouragement and application. Some of you may say, Brother Clay, I'm retirement age. My window of usefulness is closed. Well, listen, it may not be as open as wide as you think it is, but God's the one who opens and closes. And God said 80 to 120 
is more valuable to me than zero to 80 in Moses' life. Pretty important, huh? Pretty interesting. So I'm going to ask Miss Kristen to come to the piano. And I know this message hasn't been evangelistic in nature. It's aimed at those of us that are saved. But let me just say this. I think sometimes Moses is not alone in contending with God about where he should go and what he should do. You know, some of us are saved and we love the Lord, but there's times when God has clearly said, this is where you should be, and we go, no, no, no I, I can't do that. I, I'm not able to do that. Listen, Moses, at least he was honest with God, but can I tell you something? At some point, it gets very thin. Do not argue with God. If God has made it clear what you're supposed to do and where you're supposed to be, then do that. Be that. Be there. And if you're here tonight and you say, Brother Clay, I'm not saved. I've never been born again. You know, God wants to meet with you. He wants to hear you call out on His name. The Bible says all that call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Bible says if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we can be saved. You can't serve God until you've been saved by God, until you've trusted Christ. And so we're going to have a time of invitation. If you stand with me, your heads bowed and your eyes closed. You know, I, I believe we've probably got some young people that God.